Greetings again, non-Western Art Appreciation class. I hope you're doing fantastically well. Today we're going to wrap up our talks and our conversations, our lectures on Native peoples in the New World. Uh, we've actually looked at last time, we looked at kind of pre-Columbian Mexico, the early civilizations going from Olmec to Tehuacan into the Mayan. Today we'll talk about the Aztecs and then the later on kind of civilizations post-colonial that leads to such wonderful artists as Frida Kahlo. Um, then we're actually going to head south to South America to my favorite spot I've ever been, Machu Picchu, created by the Inca Empire. So we'll look at both today. Now, if you remember from last time, remember from last time, we looked at the Mesoamerican timeline in the Valley of Mexico then, we're going to have the Tehuacan, which is basically that culture that everyone said is city of gods becoming, really wonderful civilization that shows up. But the mother culture of all of them is the Olmec. The Olmec we know very little about. Remember, they are the people of rubber because we don't actually even know what their name is. That's what the word Olmec means. We still haven't translated their language. We've been able to translate the other languages, including Maya. And then later on, right before the uh, Cortez comes to the New World, we get the Aztec. And they didn't even call themselves the Aztec. They call themselves the Mixteca. So when we look at this part, this really is the Valley of Mexico that we're looking at. So the Mexica or the Azteca are right in here. So they're right in the central heart of Mexico that show up. They are particularly famous for feather work and also for glorious architecture, architecture that's enormously large. There we go. So up in front on the right-hand side, you will see the Aztec feathered headdress of the ruler. This is actually the ruler of Moctezuma, sometimes just called Montezuma. And down here is the Aztec Mexica capital of Tenochtitlan, Tenochtitlan, which means place of the prickly cactus. And that's largely based because it's based upon their founding myth. So here's the founding myth of the Aztecs or the Mexica. The Aztec, the idea of means, someone comes from Azatlan or Aztlan, and that's in the language that they spoke, Nahuatl. The Mexican king asked the Tol Toltec king, of Colhuacan for his daughter's hand in marriage. Lord Colhuacan went to congratulate the couple only to find something very disgusting for his perspective that the high priest of the Mexica was wearing her skin, was wearing his daughter's skin. The Toltec attacked and drove the Mexica to the center of the lake in the Valley of Mexico where they thought they would die. There was the sign that shows up on the Mexican flag of an eagle sitting on a cactus with a rattlesnake in his mouth. And that is the symbol that we see on the flag of Mexico. So from the Codex Mendoza from 1541 to 42, one of the codex the Spanish did not destroy, you can actually see the foundation. And here we can actually see, they literally had to dredge the water and build up the water. So it basically was Venice-like, a canal city with 10 precinct rulers that you see here. And the waterways divided the city into quarters. So each individual quarter had two to four different precinct, or precinct rulers that were ruling over it. And a reconstruction model, this is what we're looking at. The most famous spot in the entire Mexica or Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, again, the place of the prickly cactus, is this building right here. So this is the double temple. And the two temples here are supposed to represent two volcanoes that are off in the distance, that often erupted. It was the source of obsidian in the local area. So during the wintry rainy season, sun rose behind the temple of Tlaloc, the rain season, the sun rose behind the temple of Huitzilopochtli, of sun and warriors. So no, it's a double temple that shows up for temple, for the idea of rain, moon, and crying, and for sun and warriors. So there's a feminine and a masculine, a rain and a sun, an idea of crying and warriors that don't cry. You have this kind of comparison that shows up, and this was the central hub of all of Tenochtitlan. So you can see the individual, literally the courtyard could hold hundreds of thousands of people here. For the opening of this particular temple, there were 6,000 sacrifices just for the temple opening. And you can see the trail of blood actually in each case leaning down. So the double temple is dedicated to Tlaloc and Huitzilopochtli. And so it basically does unite those natural forces of sun and rain, fire and water, life and death, and both gods required human sacrifice to make the sun rain uh, come out and continue the cycle of life and agriculture. Weasley Opachli, the sun god, performs warrior, warrior sacrifices 
and Tlaloc prefer sick young male children that are probably going to die anyway. So during the spring and summer equinox, the sun rose right between the two temples and would illuminate then the temple of Quetzalcoatl right behind it and then another one for Quetzalcoatl right in front of it. And so we have this magnificent tying astronomy to their understanding of the city layout. Here's a reconstruction that actually gets you a good tour around Tenochtitlan. Show you the scale of hundreds of thousands of individuals. And from a population that easily could have been destroyed by, by another group earlier. So there's the double temple. You see the fires in the distance. The larger fires are literally going to be for temples as well. You see the main walkway going through. Note, not a lot of greenery. So we're in one of the quarters, the central precinct. You see the volcanic mountains behind. The circular building most likely are going to be observatories. You can see the open courtyards then around the temples were dedicated to the gods. So you could actually have different sacrifices around on any given day where the particular god's um, special day was. And so Tlaloc, one of the individuals in the double temple, you will know here is his image. So here you see him in Aztec Codex. And so Tlaloc is the Mayan name we'll use, um, but it's also the Mayan Toltec Aztec god of rain, moon, and tears here with the spindle, often with blue, for rain. Um, and note the open mouth with fangs coming down and a crown. So you have the crown, the fangs, the open eyes, the crown, the fangs coming down, and the open eyes, large scale, dedicated. And so um, a lot of uh, priests would actually be dedicated to rain because the rains actually are what make the crops grow. Weasley Opachli, also known as Hummingbird of the South, is the god of war and the sun. So you'll note the circle, circular emblems that show up, as well, as well as the striation of sunlight versus darkness that actually comes. So when he's out, we have the god of war and sun, and here you see it as well. The god of war, when he's not out, then you have the darkness, the moonlight, um, the idea of Tlaloc. And it was sort of kind of bringing two together. His mother is going to be one of the most terrifying goddesses in all of Mesoamerica, called Q, And his father was supposedly a ball of feathers, or in other interpretations, mixed coatl. As you come and look at this, you can see the various gods that are going to show up here. No, we have Quetzalcoatl. Here we have the, uh, the idea of the feathered serpent. Um, and so that's the feathered serpent that we often see. Over here, we have Huitzilopochtli. Again, that striation, the circular, that's the god of the sun. And so you can see the major deities of the Aztec pantheon. And like the, the Romans and the Greeks, no surprise, there are about 12 of them, one basically for each month, as they had a different system, but still the number 12 is going to be significant getting us close to 365 when we look at 20 to 40 days in each month. And that's what we're looking for. Now, what the Aztecs do is absolutely astounding. From this tiny piece of land where there is no land here in the four quadrants, they're going to create these chinampas, which are basically floating guard gardens. They are artificial islands. They're 95 feet by eight feet wide. They're basically fertilized by human waste. The Chinampas crops, no surprise, are going to be the foundation of what we have in most, uh, most Mesoamerican and Native American cultures. Maize, beans, and squash, tomatoes, chili peppers, and flowers. One half to two-thirds of the food supply actually came from these Chinampas, and it's 13 times more productive using human waste and the water that shows up here than if they want to do it on dry land because of the dryness that's right outside of here. So they were able to increase food production allowing a population explosion that went from about 12,000 to 120,000 people that were non-farmers living in the city. The family needed about half of the food they grow. So for 200 man hours a day a year, the other days that they farmed and worked on their own, they would have enough for su surplus taxes and artists. So this is what's called su um, subsistence plus. In 200 days, they grew enough. The other 165 days, it's basically what else they could have had. So they could have gotten extra beyond their basic needs met. 
So they were living a fairly comfortable middle-class life here in the capital. And that would have been true for the vast majority of individuals. The city's location and design made it vulnerable, of course, to floods and attack because it's very, not very hard to defend, particularly if the bridges go down. The Aztec king, and this is Moctezuma II, who ruled from 1502 to 1520 when Cortez showed up. Basically, it's a Quetzal animal form of the god Quetzalcoatl, which basically means the plume serpent. serpent. And here you can actually see Quetzal feathers. These are all Quetzal feathers from the Quetzal bird. You can see the beautiful green and blue with all the feather weight detail. It's really remarkable. We saw how it was stitched together, um, not just here within the Aztec world, but earlier when we saw the Oceania cultures. And so the Aztecs had a very long history of bloody coronations. So the elected official, in this case, is called a Tlautuani. He's given a dark green feather robe made with mark of skulls, and he had to offer sacrifices all the time, every 12 hours, every 12 hours to Huitzilopochtli, so from 12 a.m. to 12 p.m. for one week, and he had to offer these sacrificial offerings with this from his own ears, legs, and arms, so that is his own blood that he's actually cutting. He had to offer, at the same time, he had to offer sacrifices to Quetzalcoatl at the Great Pyramid, and specifically had to cut himself with jaguar claws, again, his own blood. For Jacques Chiquetzal, the farming god letting his own blood, spring planting and agricultural gods in the Earth Temple, and public sacrifice of coronation, flower war prisoners that his army would have gone out and collected. Once all these sacrifices were made over a one week and he had lost much blood, he's probably lightheaded, delirious, potentially even in seeing into the god world, as visible world, because he's mentioning so much blood versus our world. He actually then became an individual that could see anytime they wanted into the god world and the human world. He now became the elected Tlatuani, who basically the chief, the emperor of the entire Aztec kind of confederacy. And upon that, then the Aztec would perform a fire dance, celebrating. And we still have people that actually do the Aztec fire dance today. All the way from Mexico City to the Miccosukee Reservation in the heart of the Everglades. These Aztec fire dancers blessed our stage with some of their traditional songs, storytelling, and drumming. They captivated our crowds with their unique and colorful regalia and headpieces. You can see the non Quetzal feathers, because Quetzals were reserved, specifically those green feathers, for uh, the chief or the emperor of the Aztec. With the headdress with the face coming out, representing a skull, right? That symbol of death. We're from Mexico City. Uh, people know it as Mexico City. Uh, it's the ancient city of Mexico, Tenochtitlan. Um, we are a family. This is my father. I'm the oldest daughter. And we, we have had our family land up until the late 1930s, from before the arrival of the Spanish. Uh, so we consider ourselves very fortunate to be one of the original families that has been able to maintain uh, our identity as indigenous people of the region of Mexico City. We call ourselves Mexica. Uh, also another term that we accept is Aztec. Uh, Aztec, in, it's actually a given name to it, but our original name is Mexica. The Spanish could not pronounce Mexico Tenochtitlan. Uh, at the time, uh, our, our, our land, the Aztec uh, Empire, for lack of a better word, uh, it was formed by three city states the city state of Texcoco, Tlacopan, and Tenochtitlan. But because the and then Tlautuani then was in charge of all three of them. Mexico Tenochtitlan. Uh, the Spanish could not pronounce it, um, so they cut the name in half and they called it Mexico. My people, the Mexica, they called us Mexicanos, and they gave that name to all of the people in the territory that they claimed as theirs.
the dances that we, we showcase when we travel outside of our communities, uh, we try to give small glimpses of a festivity. Uh, a festivity is um, it's a family event. Uh, it has fun dances for the kids. It has um, very ritualistic type of dances as well. Uh, we bring what we're allowed to share. Uh, we don't just bring and, and share everything of, of our culture. We are very protective of, of what we have. However, we do believe that it's very important um, to, to erase some of the, the stereotypes, uh, some of the, the um, assumptions. Uh, so what we do is we share a little bit of our culture with people and the dances that we do, they, they share different aspects of life from the traditional ritualistic type of dances to the more family, you know, interactive racial dances. Uh, in, in Mexico, when we do our festivities, we don't have just one dance circle. The different dance circles are led by different families. In, uh, in, in Mexico, within our dance festivities, we have an expression that says, dance and conquista, dance and conquest. Right. But it's not what it is known today as a conquest. Uh, it's not a literal conquest. It's a conquest of uh, knowledge. Um, and so what he's explaining is that when we do this, this, um, um, these festivities, this dance, dance circle, what we do is that we travel throughout different parts of the central region of Mexico and the family grows. Uh, within the Salinas family, a dance circle can be 60 members to 200 members, all related, all family. You know, and um, what he's also explaining about is uh, is religion and culture. Uh, yes, the Spanish arrived and we were forced upon certain beliefs. Uh, one of them being religion. However, we don't um, we don't believe in uh, we believe in one Creator. You know, uh, as human beings, we are not perfect. So the methods, of course, are not perfect. You know. We don't hold a grudge on what happened so long ago. Uh, within the Aztec festivities, uh, we keep both uh, because a lot of the places where the churches, these buildings were, were put, is right above a lot of our old temples. Within the Aztecs, um, rules of, of war, it was just supposed to be between warriors. And you know, the, the Aztecs had actually defeated the Spanish and had told them, okay, you lost, yeah. go on back, you know. But of course they came back. By then, um, the seas had uh, weakened and killed off a lot of our people. Uh, and they had blocked the bridges that went into the city and they were starving uh, the people. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the, that was the fault of, of the Aztec, Aztec uh, government. And so as we look at kind of the most terrifying image, one of the most terrifying images from Latin America and from Mexico, it's actually this, this is Cuadalquí. And so this is the, um, the birthing of the war sun god Huitzilopochtli, the idea of Mother Earth as Cuadalquí. But it's very different than how we expect and experience Mother Earth. It's a terrifying kind of look, but a very powerful image from the Aztec or from the Mexica. So mingled with terror, so I'll read this to you. So mingled with terror is the colossal statue of Tlatopu. The sculpture embodies the duality of Mex Mexica consciousness. The colossal mass of the eight foot tall stone mass has an overpowering impact. At the very center of the figure is a contrast of quintessential opposites. Breasts behind, seen behind a skull. The two images of life and death. The figure is at once passive and active, monster and victim. This was written by a Spanish Catholic priest. Now, when this first was discovered by the Roman Catholic priest, they found this and they were disgusted by it because what you see before you is not what they saw. They saw something that would have been encrusted with three inches on every surface of sacrificial human blood. It literally would have been a stinky, smelly, rotting, literally human blood. You couldn't really even see much of the details. It would have been all obscure through about three inches of human blood. When we look at that, that is probably the sacrifice of about 10,000 different people 
or at least sacrificial blood from 10,000, whether they were actually killed or whether they let their own blood, like we saw with bloodletting ceremonies. The Spanish were so terrified, they reburied it. And then about 40 years later, they rediscovered it again, and they decided to clean it off. If you note, this is actually a white granite, and so it still has a pinkish hue. It's still that soaked in blood that gives parts of it, particularly right in here in the breast area, gives this more of a pinkish hue. And it is terrifying when you look at it. Look, it's the frontal face of a, of a rattlesnake, but note, it's also two rattlesnakes' faces that are coming together. So the duality of life and death. So they're looking both at you at profile, but at the same time, they turn and look right at you as well. So Quattle is ready to strike at any given moment. Note the fang tongue that comes out. Her breasts are showing. She has human hand sacrifices, which is one of her favorite foods. She has talons down here rather than arms that come out. She's got serpent, it's actually Quattle stands for sheet of the serpent skirt. So these serpents are basically her flow or her control of menstrual blood and talon down right here. So she can eat your heart, she can eat your hands, and she's ready to feast. So what is the message of this artwork? She of the serpent skirt of Mother Earth comes down to this. The double consciousness of two rattlesnakes becoming a monstrous super snake. The rattlesnakes are everywhere and their symbols of fertility lives on and under Earth. It renews itself by shedding and serpents rep represent blood flow. Why rattlesnakes and not some other? They're the most powerful snake and they have the power to kill individuals. Eagle talon hands to eat corpses. Same way down here, the eagle talon feet. And Quattle Q here is an opposite study. It's female earth and yet male phallic sex that shows up. It's the sun god birth which demands death. Beautifully carved but horribly iconed. Covered in three inches sacrificial human blood. Priest who found it reburied it, as I mentioned. And the hands and the human hearts are the favorite sac sacrificial food for this. Now, the reason why she is so terrifying is this. According to myth, Quattlecue's own children, star and universe gods, decapitated Quattlecue. And so two snakes popped out rather than just one. And they did that specifically because her children not believe that she became pregnant from just a ball of feathers. So they actually wanted to punish her. So the intertwined serpent bodies equal both the menstrual blood and the phallic shapes that show up. So again, the idea of the opposite study of female earth and male phallic sex. So the quadrical quadrical synapsis is this. It's a sip, thick assemblage of seemingly contradictory references to the end of life and to its renewal. You sacrifice to the, the God here that will also have this idea of renewal. It's a reference to agriculture and renewal. She's the mother of the rain and the sun god. These opposites of life and death, they're intimately woven within Mexica religion and myth. Remember the double temple that we actually saw at Tenochtitlan. And so it forces the viewer to think about cycles of life, death, and life again. So she's both a victim, because she's killed by her own children, and she's a hunter, because she's demanding human sacrifices. There we can see the human hands and the heart, which are her favorite food. Are you feeling okay? Okay. Well, we don't want you to take it all because that's supposed to be for. All right. The Aztec calendar, then, is we see here and the layout, which I'll come back and give you a chance to. But what I want to point out is notice how you read it. Here are the 20 days. 20 days make up an Aztec month. So they had 12 months of 20 days. And then a few other ritual calendar cycles that would actually give you a calendar round, very simple, similar to the way that the Mayans had their wonderful calendar round. And the Earth monster right at the middle with the four stages of the world. And now we were in the fifth stage, the last stage. One of the interesting things about contemporary Mexico is that they became very fascinated with their ancient cultures and their ancient aspects. And so here's the market supposedly at Tenochtitlan, the most varied market in the world at the National Palace. That was actually done by a very famous Mexican muralist artist um, called named Diego Rivera. And here you can actually see the features of his wife um, who's going to be Frida Kahlo. 
So if you really look, you can see all the different gifts and goods that were traded in front of the king that happened to be here with his feathered headdress. So you can actually see the various products coming in. You can see how Tenochtitlan is literally like the city of rivers. You see the double temple um, right here and other temples in the background in the distance going all the way back to the volcanoes. We are also going to see other images, for example, in the mural movement. So here we have Cortez, who basically is being greeted by the, um, the great uh, Tlatuani, um, greeted as Quetzalcoatl in the year Reed 1. There was a prediction that Quetzalcoatl was actually going to come back sometime near Reed 1. And so here he's actually being greeted because they had never seen anyone mounting horses, riding in. So he was mistaken for being um, the god Quetzalcoatl himself. And here we have by Orozco, another talking about Cortez coming in. Note the dark, negative, fiery aspect that shows up. Cortez basically conquering with the cross. Now, Cortez was able to conquer an enormous civilization. Part of it is because smallpox was wiping them out. And so they really were very sickly um, after the first battle, which the Aztecs or the Mexica won. But then really smallpox knocked them out. The Spanish justified their conquest and the destruction of almost everything Aztec, Mexica, as being filthy and dirty and awful, specifically, and they brought in um, Our Lady, Our Church of Our Lady of Guadalupe, they brought in the Virgin Mary. And the person who saw it was an Aztec woman, or Aztec man named Juan Diego, or that's his name later on. During a walk from his village to the city on 1531, Juan Diego, this individual here, saw a vision of Virgin Mary at the hell of Tepeyac. The virgin told him to gather flowers from the hill, even though it was winter. And when the roses fell from his apron, an apron, an icon of the virgin remained imprinted on the cloth. And therefore, that is where Juan Diego's church, um, or actually I should say the Church of Our Lady of Guadalupe, um, is actually right on that spot where Juan Diego dropped the flowers and then miraculously the image of the virgin appeared there as a miracle. Later on, on another job that you could potentially consider, it's the idea of a political cartoonist. One of the great early political cartoonists is Jose Pesada, a Mexican individual. And he's most famous then for promoting the idea of the, the skeletons, of the calaveras. So here's one for rebuilding after the earthquake. Here's one where they represent Don Quixote, revolutionary Zapata, who's actually all about getting um, individual Mexican individuals' rights that were in the agrarian population and land they can farm on rather than the haciendas being owned off by the Spanish, almost in a medieval way of kind of controlling land and labor and making people work for you in a fuel system. Another famous individual, actually I mentioned him already, uh, Diego Rivera. This is his man at the crossroads. This was highly controversial because this was done in Detroit, Michigan, and yet it promotes socialism and communism. And so it was ordered to be destroyed later on um, and so, so the first one was going to be done in New York City, and the one that was actually created then was actually done in, and allowed to stay for some time in Detroit. So if you look at the two different sides here, you will note all sorts of different symbolism that show up. So man at the crossroads. World War I soldiers are appearing gas masks. We have Zeus, the Greek father of the gods in power with the light people ready to strike. Charles Darwin we have up here teaching the idea of evolution right here. We have microscopic images of venereal diseases, which we are just starting to discover. Police brutality that's actually taking place against a minority right here. Hand reaches out, controlling the idea of atomic energy right in the middle. And on the other side, note, a united peasant revolution protecting communist troops. So on some level, he was a pro-communist, pro-socialist, which really upset us because this was our closest neighbor and we were worried about communism taking over into the United States. <laughs> because we feared with the Cold War what was taking place. Zeus over here with the Greek father of the gods. Note he's now been beheaded, right? We don't need gods and religion within this. Lenin and Trotsky right here. The founders of the Russian communism are celebrated. Uh, we have biblical teaching of creation of the heavens that are actually taking place right here again. And then the hand reaches out controlling. So it's kind of science and religion. It's also capitalism, politics. It's war. It's science. It's kind of everything about the man at the crossroads 
on where we were between the 1930s and the 1940s in Diego Rivera because he sided with more of the socialist communist aspect versus the capitalist aspect. This was ordered to be destroyed. In the history of Mexico, in the National Palace of Mexico, Diego Rivera, this is on one of the staircases going up. So this is another part of his history of Mexico. If you look very closely, you will actually notice a number of things we talked about. The flying feather serpent, Quetzalcoatl, the idea of the volcano, the sun being a god, the individual wearing Quetzal uh, feathers over here, the agrarian population wearing the various bark cloth that we had actually seen in other images um, from the Native Americans, the idea of carving glyphs. And, and so you see the entire range of what's taking place, jaguar knights and eagle knights. And one of the things that shows up out of this tradition then, was, which is really a Mexican tradition um, that is the Spanish instrumentation with a Mexican tradition is mariachi. So if you don't know, mariachi is a musical group consisting of, as you can see here, violins, trumpets, Spanish guitar, a viola, which is a high-pitched five-string guitar, um, and a guitarron, a small-scale acoustic bass. Uh, it's got melodic passages, passages exchanged between the violins and the trumpets, and the, between the violins and the trumpets. I am there, the violins and the trumpets there. Few percussion instruments, almost never. And the vocalists use the full, often operatic voice it's often complemented by occasional catcalls and laughter of our. And so this is the music of weddings. This is the music of celebration all throughout Mexico. And you can note right in front, this is the traditional costume then of individuals that are playing mariachi music. And this is papel picado above, also for celebrations, which is basically the art of paper cutting that shows up. So this is La Tigaracha. This was done during the Mexican Revolution, and it was a representation in honor of how a woman can really, as a cockroach, could take stuff from everywhere and really could not be eradicated. She was so powerful. And it's probably the most famous mariachi song of all time. And so when we think about that in the modernity, we have to think about kind of Mexico is a, what we call as a Mexicanidad culture. It's one of the only cultures in the world that takes all the references from the past, the good, the bad, the ugly, their wins and their losses, and combines it unlike almost any other culture that we have on earth. So they celebrate everything, and they say all of it is Mexico. The Spanish Christian coming over, the conquest itself, the idea of being made subservient, the smallpox, the Aztecs, the Toltecs, the Mexica, um, the Olmec, it's all Mexican, and that's what they're looking at here. So this is Diego Rivera's History of Mexico from the National Palace. And I'll give you a second to look through it, but if you really do start looking, you will notice even in terms of, here's the eagle with the rattlesnake sitting on the cactus, right, the place of Tenochtitlan. You can look down and at the conquistadores that are coming in and the battles that are fighting with jaguars that show up. You can look at, unfortunately, rape scenes and things that do take place that are part of Mexican heritage. Um, because they consider everything as part of their heritage. So it's a pretty fascinating culture where the United States, we talk about all the good stuff, right? We, we generally hide away from the fact that, you know, we massacred a number of millions of Native Americans and genocide. Um, we massacred and put people into slavery. In Mexico, it's all part of it, both the good and the bad. They don't shy away from anything. So they really do have a very good grasp on their own history. Orozco, another one of the great muralists, gets invited to the United States, along with many of the other murals, like what happened with Diego Rivera. And so this is at Dartmouth College, um, and the, uh, actually Dartmouth is up in New Hampshire, maybe it's Vermont. Um, what is the message of this Jorge, Jose Orozco? No, this is actually called stillborn education. So here we have the uh, woman giving birth to this dead educational model, like all these different things, and the, that we're not learning the right things. 
right? On some level, we are learning about dead books, dead myths, dead heroes. We're not learning enough about the modern day world or we're not learning about the history that actually has an impact on the modern day. And so who are all the professors? People who look like the dead infant, right? Teaching you stuff that's not that valuable. That's not what you, we really need to know about. One of the great muralists actually is Judy Baca. Judy Baca actually basically started painting in, in Los Angeles. She starts to make this mural. It becomes the longest mural in world history. She has 400 different youths that are doing these large scale images and she's been doing it for a number of years in Los Angeles. And here's what it looks like today. There are all sorts of different things. So it's called the Great Wall of Los Angeles. It's the longest mural in the world. And it basically tells the history of the United States of America including all the immigrants, all the Native Americans, all the African, basically doing Mexicanida, but for America, talking about Jewish refugees, nonviolent resistance, where they came from the Holocaust, Mexican refugees that show up within that nonviolent re re resistance. And the beautiful thing about it is it can continue on. We can keep making American history and keep interpreting all these things from the past. This led actually, um, African-Americans than Mexican tradition to create great walls of respect. So in Chicago on 46th Street, Southside Chicago, 1962, William Walker and his friends, African-Americans created these murals as meeting places for civil rights meetings. So they were actually the markers on where the civil rights would come to meet in the model of social protest art that came out of the mural movement in Mexico. One of the challenges that we have is what do we do with Frida Kahlo? And that is because Frida Kahlo basically um, has two different worldviews and two different ideas. So the idea of two Fridas here is there's the Mexican Frida here and the Victorian Frida. And so she explores her identity as a mestizo, as a Mexicana, as a mixed race ancestry. So she believes in native Mexican folk art style, as you can see, exploring her identity. She's interested in race, class, gender, body function. She's actually in a ter terrible um, trolley accident, which disables her along with polio. And so she actually has a metal spine. She calls it the broken column that actually holds her and allows her to survive, even though miserably painful throughout her life. She um, very much is a pro-communist individ she, individual. She very much disliked capitalism, which makes sense. She was married to Diego Rivera. And she's associated with the surrealists who keep getting her to try to join because they say, look at your imagery. It's very surreal. It's about the idea of science and and kind of dreamlike quality. And she says, yes, it is, but I'm exploring my own identity. I'm not exploring Freudian psychosexual concepts. So she never joins, even though the Surrealists often like to claim her because let's face it, there's not too many women in the Surrealist movement. And the idea would give them some clout because she's so famous living in Mexico. So the question is, is Frida Kahlo a Surrealist? Surrealism, remember, fascinated by Freud psychoanalysis and science, and the guilt of World War I consciousness to develop a new art style. Note, she doesn't have that guilt of World War I consciousness. She's not fascinated by Freud's psychoanalysis, even though she is dealing with the science, but the science that allows her to create her own gender identity. So by those definitions, she's really not a surrealist, even though her image looks very surrealist. And she is one of the cultural heroes then. We see her appear over and over in ads and advertisements, everything from Bert and Ernie as Diego and Frida, to the Mona Lisa Frida, to Barbie as a Frida, which actually you can't buy. And so Frida is a celebrated supporter of indigenous rights, feminism, and LGBTQQ rights. She even shows up in Coco and Disney. Another artist, which is a really interesting artist from Chicago is Mario Castillo. Mario Castillo, this is called Ancient Mexicanidad. And note, we've got this kind of symbolic man that shows up. I will tell you, this is pre-Avengers. 1983, for when you're looking at the image, Morris Castillo, media is he actually uses paint and his own sperm. So he takes the color of paint and he ejaculates his sperm into it. And he tries to paint that, giving it an essence within it. What's amazing about his work, large scale, so if you look really closely, and it's hard to do an image like this, there are images on top of images on top of images. So you probably have noticed the man here, right? The kind of glowing, flaming, sun god man. If you note, there's also a Native American head that runs right on the outline here, which leads us to an earlier Toltec head, which leads us to see the spiked cactus underneath. So there are actually five different layers of different elements. There's the Toltec warrior. Here's the mother and child that we saw. 
Um, note here's Mayan glyphs, the writing that shows up. And so it is a layered approach on some level, how ancient Mexican culture, if you go deeper and deeper and deeper based upon the colors and the shape, you'll see multiple different ways of things um, showing throughout history. Starting going back all the way, there's an Olmec head here. We've got Toltec. We've got the Aztec Quetzalcoatl that we saw at Chichen Itza. We've got the shape of the pyramids. We've got the herons that live on the lake. We've got the Toltec images and kind of design myths. We have the idea of maize and corn. If you really start looking, you'll see all these different features. They're just layered over one another till you get this very complex rhythm of structure that shows up, which makes it very hard to understand and much easier if you're there, we can actually look at the various different levels. Push your head, someone's on your head, you know, my head. Yeah, hilarious. <clears throat> All right. From Mexico, then, we move south to South America. And where the culture that we really want to spend the most time on, actually, then, is the Inca. And the Inca are that dominant culture. You'll note the length of the Inca Empire runs all the way from southern Chile up through Peru, through Ecuador, and really even into a little bit of Colombia. Um, it, it's a huge culture, all connected with a road structure that was made by the Inca to, for communication up and down on the spine that shows up. This is actually where potatoes were first domesticated. And so even though we think of potatoes in the kind of great Irish potato famine, that's because of the Colombian exchange. Potatoes came over to Ireland. They grew fantastic or grew fantastic in Ireland. But the problem was in Ireland, they only grew one or two species. So when a major climatic change happened and there was a problem with the soil, all the potatoes died and the Irish had to flee somewhere. Those Irish then fled into Boston and New York, establishing that area. I mean, today think about it, the Boston Celtics, really that Irish culture that came over, the Celts, um, that is literally because of the, they did not grow nearly as many potato crops as the Inca. The Inca had 40 different species of potato, the same way that in um, today we face the same problem. We only currently grow four species of corn or maize today. The Inca, ancient Mexica, Mexica and Native Americans grow 45 different species. So if we actually have a bug that really takes out those four species, we're in trouble because that's the basis of a good portion of the American diet. Right? We've got to learn from our ancestors. The artwork that we want to start off looking at first is in Peru. And this is actually a pre-Incan culture. This is called the Nazca Lines. They're in southern Peru in a desert area down here that you can see. The best way to see them is by helicopter or by plane. And what they are is they are enormous, enormous, some of them being a quarter mile long, images that you see from the sky. And you can note all the different shapes and things. So here's a hummingbird. There's even a killer whale. There's a monkey. There's a vulture. There are trees. There are hands. And so the Nazca region is a desert agriculture area. It's only used because of the aqueduct technology that allows water to flow there. Um, the, it's a major pilgrimage center for major ceremonies. And initially it was thought that these would be guideposts on where to go for the ceremonies, almost like a giant map. The problem, of course, is the map is really only seen from above, as you can see how laid out the different images are. The straight lines and the spirals generally represent stars' motions. And so it's also tied to the movement of the stars and animals, potentially even constellations, and how they rise. And the star motion, as well as the water in the desert, really gives us the idea of life and death, that duality that we saw in Mexica and in um, 
Aztec and Mayan art. So you really could only see the, the lines from air. But if you come up and you look at the ground view, you see how beautifully they are. So they're pretty simple to make um, in terms of just the style itself. It's a matter of moving the rock, which is a darker color, as you see here, and leaving and digging down to the top of the dirt where you can see this brownish or whitish color that shows up. The hard part, of course, is think about them as almost giant football fields. How do you keep that in shape if you are only ever down on the ground to create those? And so here's a monkey with a 328 feet across. So that monkey is as large as a football field, including the spiral of the tail. The killer whale right here, which is amazing because there's no killer whales that live anywhere near here, is 420 feet across. The spider, which is beautifully complex, look at the eight legs and the way it's shaped out, 164 feet. The, kill, or the man right here is 128 feet tall, but note how the man almost makes it look alien. Um, see the kind of the large shape, the large head with only the eyes being emphasized. And so these are called the Nazca lines. Now this later on is gonna lead us to uh, try to understand the Inca cosmos. And here we see the Inca cosmos is based upon this, to want the four regions between 1438 to 1533. So the Inca king was believed to be the son of the sun, and the Cosmo was centered at the sun temple at Cusco, Peru, which is on your way to Machu Picchu. So here we have the Milky Way was believed to blend into the underworld, and so it brought dark fertile mud to the sky upon its return. So it's got this circular elm. And this forms patches in the clouds, which represent animals, like the snake for constellations, toad, the Tinamu bird, um, the baby llama, a fox, uh, a second team of moose of the twins. And so the Inca believed that they emerged from three caves or from Lake Titicaca, so it held special significance. And you'll see the red lines that are here then, the red lines coming across, they're connections basically to the sacred world. So you see how it divides the world up basically into a four-quartered world here with the below and the of the above. The Inca's most famous celebration then is the Inti, which is the celebration of the sun. It happens on the winter solstice when the sun is furthest away. Note the winter solstice because it's south of the equator is June 20th to 21st. That's when we celebrate our summer solstice. Just so you know, it kind of is we have orientation and we have large scale masquerading and dancing and celebration that it is the shortest day of the year and soon the sun will come back. And so the Inti and the king are offered potato and llama sacrifices, and it basically ensures a successful harvest in the upcoming year. Now, the most famous place where you can actually celebrate the Inti is one of my favorite places on earth. I'm here today at Machu Picchu. And Machu Picchu is their ceremonial center. If you look at the ceremony, it's just gorgeous. They believe that this is their god, one of their gods, actually laying down, taking a neck. No, forehead, it looks like this, nose, Smooth chun coming up. So that is one of their gods taking a waiting to be awakened. Just getting to Machu Picchu is an adventure because there are multiple different types of roads from large scale conglomerate that we see here. They go up and it rises 10,000 feet. You have to go over a couple of uh, rope bridges over very cold mountainous water. So the Inca uh, Empire, the way that it was composed is largely like this. It's the Inca road system. And every family had to contribute a certain amount of labor. This is called Nita service. Everyone has to contribute. So the Inca Empire is 2,600 miles um, long. It's the size of China. They have 15,000 miles of roads with lodgings that were spaced basically one day apart. So you would always have a place to stay. Relay runners could pass a message across the empire in seven days. They basically would run 15 miles an hour for 24 seven, hand it to the next person, hand it to the next person, hand it to the next person. And in seven days, the emperor could actually know what's going on in his entire empire, which is the size of China. The only faster form of communication up until modern day technology with the telegraph and with the cell phone and with the computer and the internet and satellite was China, the Great Wall, where they did smoke signals. So you could transfer the entire length of China in two to three days. So that was twice as fast as this, but this is people running. The bridge construction had to be redone as part of your media service every couple of years. And so they have a pair of massive stone anchors on either side. 
with massive cables that are woven of ichi grass that you would actually weave together. And this is how people got across the Inca Empire from one side to the other. And so the cable was replaced, the main cable here, right here and right here, was replaced one time a year by local as part of their public service obligation to the emperor and to the Inca. So this is also what carried Spaniards while um, riding horses later on. So it was very, very strong. And here you can actually see them pounding the um, lovely grass here that shows up. And you would pound that and twist that, and that actually becomes the rope here. So that's the massive. Machu Picchu itself means old peak. And it's the lost city of the Incas. It's at 9,000 feet. What's amazing is that every stone that you potentially see here was carried up from the ground floor. The Inca believed this mountain was so holy that they did not cut any of the rock himself. It was too holy for that. It was the place of their gods. So they would bring up a rock and put it in exactly the right place. The next person would bring up the next rock. It was a ritual place, so the female to male ratio was 10 to 1, 10 females to every one male. And because it was a ritual place for the gods and for the very uber wealthy. So the Inca believed that the sacred mountain rock should never be cut. And so it's basically built from loose boulders and different types of packs that we'll talk about with no mortars. And the boulders were pulled by men all the way up the mountain using ropes. So there's three different types of styles. So you can see, we have the monumental style for important buildings, for like palaces, large, well-fitting blocks. Look how well those blocks fit. Very smooth joints, no mortar. It's just the pressure of the rock holding it together. Then we have intermediate style, which I don't have an example of less skillfully laid blocks, mostly smooth joints, little mortar used, and then here, field stone style, basically to make their roads. Not much skill, anyone could bring up those rocks, you put them in, joints filled with mortar, with dirt, with grass, and this is what most of the roads were made throughout the Inca Empire. On Machu Picchu then, besides having your, you know, your great god behind you, you'll note as you climb up, and this is right here, so this is that section right here. I'll show you another. So going up the right here, right here is the Inti, which is the hitching post of the god. So on the summer solstice, as it rises at Machu Picchu, it literally the sun rises right over this building. So you literally it heats up faster, and you can feel it and draw energy from the hitching stone, which supposedly is tied in with the gods. And many people go there and have this remarkable experience. So as we think about it, we want to think about the way nature is used. Compare and contrast these sacred depictions of nature. Remember, travelers amongst the stream that made up one. Itsukishima, the entire idea of that very revered island where no dogs, no people die. It's the invention of origami and the, the no theater. It's that, you know, where that sacred deer of the messengers. And the Dome of the Rock, where Abraham was going to sacrifice his only son, Isaac and then holds back to not sacrifice the sun. They're also going to have the Inca, this idea, a very complex system of knots called Kipu, Q-U-I-P-U. -U. And so there's no written Inca language. And so you need a way of keeping records in terms of taxes, amount of people. And so they use knots to keep the records. So there's color combinations that help you take. Spin directions, whether it's an S spin or a Z spin, you have wrappings and how often, whether you have recto or verso, and you have color splice, and, and someone has to know how to read this kipu and be able to in turn interpret right, how many does it mean for spin direction, how many does it mean for recto versus verso, and the wrappings in the way, whether it's over or under, how many different color combinations are there for each knot, and this is how we actually read kipu. And so the weaving itself, based upon the kipu, and also Andean weaving, is considered one of the great art forms from the time period. They will often have 500 threads per square inch, which is remarkable. So the fine textiles were the source, sources of prestige and wealth, particularly with the very complicated designs. So it's the most technically complex cloth woven ever, even more than the Muslim carpets, garden carpets that we looked at. And to make it exceptionally fantastic, sometimes they wove and then unwove and then rewove the carpet or the carpet, the dress for special effects so that we can get multiple layers of color on top of one another. There are going to be symbols, just like in any others you can see over here. The patterns represent a person's ethnic identity and their social rank. 
Some of the motifs make reference to earlier cultures, such as step diamonds. Let's see if I can find a step diamond here, or something from the Wari. A three stair step going up from the earlier Moche culture. In the best clause, no two um, blocks or squares are exactly the same. They're all slightly different with structure and spice. And there were three classes of this cloth. There was one for household use with 120 threads per square inch, a waska. There's the gompi for ritual use, and one for the sun god cloth that was worn by virgins, uh, also worn by gods and the emperor, 600 threads per square inch, which is just remarkable. They also have, they live life, even today then, because we do have the residents um, of the Inca. This is not a civilization that died out. Their great heyday died out, but we still have people of Incan descent today. Same way we have people of Mayan and Aztec descent. They still live in a collective life where they believe in reciprocity, equality, community solidarity, often up in the mountains. Their music is tied to agricultural life changes, weddings, first haircut, um, when they're gonna go plant or harvest. And they only ever play in communal wind ensembles during public festivals, because they have to play in circuit because not any one of the pan types has all the different notes that you need to play. So all men can play no matter how bad you are, which makes it fun. Again, they believe in equality, community solidarity. So the men must play in hocket because each pan pipe would contain only half of the tones of musical notes. And the repetitive pattern is almost always A, A, B, B, C, C, A, A, B, B, C, C. If there are singers, it's gonna be women's, and that's for a preference for high-pitched female voice. So here's what some of the most beautiful music of the Andes sounds like. Not yet. There it is. Listen, if you can hear the A A B B C C structure in this one. And so as we think about the native peoples, one thing to hit up at one more time is the idea that the native peoples, we now think of them as really one enormous cultural grouping across North America and South America, making them by distance and by number of ethnicities and number of different groups, tribes, ethnic groups, as the most varied in all of the world. Um, really only comparable with Africa. When we look at about 2,500 different, there's roughly 2,500 different ones in this one area as well, speaking multiple different languages. And because they, they cover every geographic area, we have very different responses, but the same common responses and concerns that we have. So going all the way from the, the Olmec, to, excuse me, Navajo pottery, to the idea of the Aztec. And here's what we often think about these people today versus the wonderful, great cultures that they actually created. So there are a number of faces, number of issues facing it, but no, such a large group. And they compose the better part of about 20 different nations. There's small minorities in those 20 different nations. So there's radical different departures. A lot of it has to do with the stereotype and the kind of the, the elimination of their indigenous culture. And what do we do about the elimination of the indigenous culture? A lot of these individuals still want to live in a more traditional format and not enter completely into a modern capitalist structure. So how do we actually accommodate that and kind of give them what they want for self-determination living in the rainforest, even though the rainforest, they might say, oh, it's a national park, like we saw with the San Kalahari um, and moving them off the national park into kind of these reservation areas. The idea of the reservation areas, we put them in places that have terrible, terrible, terrible access to the natural resources that they're used to because we often move them from an area like that was a woodland mound area and we move them into a desert area and many of those groups have adjusted quite nicely now but what do we do we have not actually done very little in development um, in most of these native groups because we're so concentrating on developing the middle class and people in the capitalist culture and what do we do when people really don't want to be involved with that but they still want basic resources like water and electricity so there's a number of challenges that are coming up, not just for us, but also these individuals, because many nations have designed the reservation system. So the reservation system is supposed to be self-sufficient. 
So the idea is that if that is self-sufficient, then they should develop their own water, their own energy, but they're off the grid. And so that means they would actually have to invest in all of that extra money, is it, even though we took their land from them. So we have a number of different issues that are showing up. So let's play A to Z. Challenge A to Z. Think of an artwork, a personality, an invention, or an aesthetic from each letter of the alphabet about the new world, about something that went on with the traditional aspect of the new world. And you should probably be able to get all of the letters because X and Z are pretty well covered actually now, particularly X within the Mayan and the Aztecs. Good luck, I'll give you 10 minutes. And then we'll also come back and talk about, can you come up with what are the top 10 most important things about the new world that you should actually be able to know. Have a wonderful night and good luck reviewing. Bye.